B, and I'm the director and founder of the College of the Melissa Center for Secret Beekeeping. As you are well aware, the insect world and the animal queendom has been suffering for a long time on the planet today. As are humans, as we walk around in full awareness of our effects on the Anthropocene Epoch. So in 2012, following Vision, I developed the College of the Melissa. This is an online learning platform devoted to the study of apiculture. And as we were uncovering the mysteries of the bee, we developed a six-fold sacred path. That is the science, the sacred, the history, the mystery, the art, medicine, and activism of the bee. First, let's start with science. Not only do we study traditional Western apiculture, we stretch and explore many multicultural approaches to taking care of the bee. From Zeidler beekeeping, to indigenous beekeeping, to the personal beekeeping style that you discover on your path. We also are interested in what is going on with the bee's body, forage, and the environment in general. Whenever you study the bee, you realize these amazing, gorgeous principles that lead us directly to the sacred. And what is sacred? Sacred are principles which shall not be violated. Take, for example, the principle of pollination. The bee and her generosity offers such a sacred template. And as we discover these amazing sacred principles of the bee, we'll find out that we're not the first ones to think of this. Peoples throughout the ages, across the world, anywhere we see people in relationship to honey producing insects, we find wonderful history. And within that rich history is not only apiculture, but archetype, mythology, sacred relationship with the earth, which leads us to mystery. Mystery is really defined as what you find yourself as you gain an experience with meeting the bee on your own personal level. What does she say to you? What do you dream of? People everywhere associate the honeybee with dreaming and increased intuition. We've certainly discovered that for ourselves. And of course, when you're following intuition, it leads us to art and medicine, something that we feel is a continuum. All art is medicine and all medicine is an art. Whether you enjoy dance, painting, sculpture, jewelry making, all the way to the deep healing principles of the bee, we explore relationships with hive products. And of course, when you learn about the bee, you want to protect the bee. So the bee is a vanguard for all pollinators. And that leads us to activism. That which we love, we protect. So if you're interested in following this sort of way of studying the bee, please come and find us at collegeofthemelissa.com or write me directly at queenbee at collegeofthemelissa.com. very grateful that we're having an opportunity to have um, two of our Rahiba uh, do a presentation today. And uh, Patricia has been a Rahiba in the, in the group for a long time, even though this year she's finishing her formal second year of study with us because she's, um, and I have been working together since like 2014 or something like that, maybe 2013. And um, uh, Patricia has been a wonderful um, mentor for me. Um, spiritually and in leadership for this group. So you may not realize it, but this group has been influenced by my relationship with Patricia on that note. So I know Patricia through Honey in the Heart and the way that she shares and integrates her medicine work on the planet with her political and civic work um, with um, pollinator activism in the Bay Area. So we're going to let Patricia introduce her actual work, but that's how I know Patricia, and I'm very grateful for your presence in my life. And uh, Rebecca, of course, um, really enabled me to go to Turkey and uh, go to Apamondia um, by not only being an amazing tour guide, but an, an incredible emotional support cheerleader and witness. And also, we were both really blessed by Artemis on that trip. Um, and um, 
Rebecca is the first Rehiba to graduate into very deep level priestesshood within this tradition and is also serving in leadership um, in this group. So it's with great um, excitement that we're witnessing Rebecca doing her own vision um, after studying together for five or six years and really um, Rebecca influencing so deeply the work of the College of Melissa. Um, Rebecca has had her own vision uh, within um, her life to serve the Melipona um, be in the Yucatan and the people and the culture that celebrate the Melipona. So I'm very excited to see um, and hear from Rebecca. One of the extra special things I think about the Melipona coming, and I don't, I don't, I hope this isn't what you were going to see in your speech, but um, is that it's an American bee and it is a sacred American bee. And so for us to have two people that are fascinated and, and, um, and celebratory, celebratorily, impassionately inspired by the Melipona. Um, and I believe that Patricia has her own very deep connection there as well and long, and long relationship um, with them for many years. So for, that, for you to be bringing forth this mystery is so perfect for the College of the Melissa. It is um, really how we want to go in the future with understanding the indigenous voice. And it is a great gift that you have both been inspired and are able to bring that vision to fruition um, and be in the beginning. And we get to witness and uh, support the beginning stages. So we don't, So I'm not going to take a lot of time. We may have a shorter question and answer period at the end. But without further ado, uh, we're going to start with, is there any other announcements real quick, Steve? Is there anything we need to know business-wise um, for the group? Just that next Tuesday will be a special hive mind with Mikhail Thiele mm -hmm. talking about tree beekeeping. It's going to be two hours starting at this time. And the following week is Phyllis. And we will have some handouts for both. Great. So keep an eye on your emails. And uh, thank you, Steve. And we're very excited to have Tile here um, because he's just one of our favorites in the world of bee. So, Rebecca, you let me know if you'd like me to manage your slideshow or if you would like to do it yourself and I can jump um, in if you need me. Yeah. L let's try you doing it, Laura, because I'm, I don't have stable internet. Okay, let me know when you'd like me to share yeah. screen and open. Um, go ahead and open the slideshow, okay. please. And I'm in speaker view. You should be recording perfectly. All right. Wow. Okay. The, <laughs> the magic of technology. I'm just, wow, that's so awesome. So uh, the first thing, uh, it will be Patricia and I um, sharing this time together. So I'm going to do uh, 30 or 40 minutes and then Patricia will follow up with 45 minutes or so. So that's um, how we're going to go about filling this two hours. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of background uh, about what, what, where I'm coming from, where my interest lies in the Melipona. About 20 years ago, I did Route de Maya with my sister. We traveled for three months through Mexico, through Guatemala, touch Belize a little bit, and back into the Yucatan Peninsula. And what we did is we went from Mayan temple, Mayan ruin to Mayan ruin for three months. So I felt at that time, I was really touched by the land itself, that something happened to me energetically that possessed me. Uh, in 2012, uh, the end of the 26,000 year Mayan calendar was December 21st, solstice, the winter solstice of 2012. 
I went back to Mexico again and spent an entire month in the Yucatan. And the Yucatan Peninsula is where a lot of the Mayan temples were. And, and Patricia will get more into the geographer, geography of that in her presentation. But I was down there for a month at the end of the Mayan calendar. And this was actually before I was a beekeeper and I got invited to a special ceremony at Ushmal, one of the largest temples on December 21st, 2012. And in that ceremony, I was offered Mayan honey and to eat the larva of bees. So I think that actually was my invitation from the Melipona to come back. And uh, this past February, I went as a delegate uh, to the Yucatan, to the city of Valladolid. Valladolid is the honey capital of Mexico. And I went there because Phyllis Stiles, uh, my uh, mentor and woman who inspires me the most, other than Laura, uh, asked, uh, they had reached out to Phyllis to see if she wanted to go along on the delegation and she was busy. And so I went, but I think, again, it was the, the esoteric dominoes being moved around to get me to come back um, on that trip. Which, and I was down there for two weeks. And on that, this trip in February, this past February, right before COVID shut, down, shut us all down, I met the Melipona bees. So that's a little bit of my history. Next slide. Laura. Great, thank you. So let's meet the Melipona. Um, <laughs> I'd say, uh, hang on to your pantyhose. We are in for a ride. Strap on your wings and we are going to go behind the veil. Uh, Next slide. Uh, coming up is a short video, about eight minutes, that was produced, created and produced by Stephen Buckman. Stephen Buckman, go ahead and advance the slide, Laura, and, and start, because I know it took some time to download. I'll talk while it's downloading. Um, Stephen Buckman, as Phyllis has informed me, was credited back in the 90s for bringing the, um, the decline of pollinators worldwide to everybody's attention. So Stephen is a professor uh, who studies pollinators and he's the one who sent up the, the flag that said, wait a minute, we're in crisis. This is his film. These walls. These temple cities. Time bears witness to the birth of these great stone civilizations and their inhabitants. They abandoned these cities five centuries ago. But they brought their sophisticated traditions and culture with them. The Maya are not gone. There is another, more ancient society living in these tropical forests. They are social bees. And just as their wondrous architecture and honey making have been passed from generation to generation. So has the Mayan art of beekeeping. These are the same stingless bees their ancestors tended for millennia. Melpona bichii, the royal or lady bee. Of all the kinds of bees in their world, these are the ones held sacred by the Maya. The Madrid Codex 
brought to Spain from a newly conquered empire, informs us about these bees, their bee god, and the beekeepers. Melipona beechii live in tree hollows, and their honey is perhaps the best tasting in the world. A golden treasure worth protecting. This small hole is the only entrance to their nest and is defended vigilantly by a guard bee. Flight traffic is heavy today. Foragers return laden with colorful pollen and stomachs full of nectar from rainforest flowers. They are the most important pollinators of the rainforest trees. But it's what they do with pollen and nectar that is most remarkable. Inside a melipona nest, a magnificent wax architecture is revealed. Here is the bee society. Queen, workers, young bees and larvae are found here among the cells of the brood comb. Nearby are larger storage pots containing pollen or honey, the pantry of the bees. They only produce one or two liters of honey each year, making it precious to the bees and people. Before the Madrid Codex was written, these beekeepers collected and relocated the bees hollowed out homes and brought them to a more convenient location. Mayans call their beehives Hobon. They're brought to thatch roof shelters, meliponaries, tended and today harvested for honey. One of the last Mayan beekeepers removes the end block from this hobon, revealing the fat storage pots filled with honey. The bees are frenzied by the scent of spilled honey. Rubber Africanized honey bees can't resist and swarm in to steal the honey. Here, as recently as 50 years ago, Beekeeping traditions were healthy with grand ceremonies, honoring the bees and offerings to Amos in Cobb. Today, it's difficult to find a village with the beekeepers still managing stingless bees. After surviving more than two millennia, Mayan culture is now threatened. In our time, as aging beekeepers die without passing along their skills, young adults have left to work in tourist cities along the coast. Parasitic flies attack colonies while beekeeping skills are rapidly lost. Flowering plants are less abundant and Africanized honeybees are managed commercially by the thousands, leaving few resources for the native stingless bees. Despite their deep history, the survival of one of the last remnants of ancient Mayan culture has fallen to this generation, here and now. In a few places, young and old come together, speaking about bees in their native language. The role of melipona honey as food and as powerful medicine is remembered as treasured knowledge. A few classes and workshops are teaching Mayan traditions and the ancient bee craft. New meliponaries are appearing in a few remote villages. The beekeeping message seems to be spreading. But if they aren't careful, we may all soon find out whether the bees outlast their keepers. That's good, Laura, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, now I'm going to show you a few images of the Melipona bees themselves. Uh, a lot of them were taken from this book. I hope Maria is watching. The book's in French, 
Uh, so, but gorgeous pictures. Uh, and the image on the right is Francisca holding the little honey pot, a little honey pot in her hand. So next slide. Uh, this is the Melipona bee covered with pollen. You can see that she's got pollen pockets uh, quite similar to Apis mellifera. And notice her eyes, how extraordinary her eyes are. They're also known as the blue-eyed bee. And you see that her, her entire body is covered with pollen. She is a very important pollinator for the rainforest. Um, in the, the Central Americas. And just a little side note, the European honeybee, the bee that we are most familiar with, Apis mellifera, was imported 400 years ago from Europe. So it's the colonial bee. This bee, the Melipona, is native to the Americas. It is the only native honeybee to the Americas. She is our bee, native to the Americas. And she also has never been genetically modified. So the bee that we are looking at right now is the bee that they've had for centuries. Next slide. Okay. Isn't this sweet? This is a guard bee. So the Melipona hives uh, generally would have been in trees or in the, you saw the log hives, the habones. There's a very, very small entrance with one guard bee at the entrance. So all the bees are flying in and out this tiny hole. So that is a guard bee. Well, the bee god, Almuzin Cobb, you'll see depicted sitting above the temple entrance, guarding the temples. Next slide. Okay, um, I put these up here so you could just see the different parts of the bees. This is the image on the left. You see her five eyes, no, oh, I can't point. Um, big, huge eyes on each side and then the three little eyes in the middle of her forehead. You see her antenna. Uh, the middle slide is her abdomen. Um, how gorgeous and vibrant the yellow stripes are. Uh, and my screen is covering the other slide. I think it's eyes and antenna. Next slide. Okay. Take a guess, it's the queen. So the queen, uh, you can see again, she's bigger. She's got a really fat abdomen. Uh, Maria will have to weigh in and tell me because I couldn't read the French, but I believe the eggs are laid. That's an image of the egg. And it looks like the royal jelly is fermenting or bubbly. So I couldn't understand the French. Next slide. Uh, this is pollen. In the hive, there's a, a brood area, and then separately, they create pots out of wax. Again, pot out of wax. And in those pots are either honey or pollen. So it's the structure of the hive is quite different uh, than the hives we're familiar with. Next slide. Uh, they build their uh, comb in a pyramid shape. The image on the right is actually the little connector section that is separating layer and layer and layer of the, 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 the brood comb. The Mayans will say that the bees taught them how to build the pyramids. The Mayans say the bees taught them how to build the pyramids. Next slide. 
Okay. Uh, this is me in the middle. <laughs> this is me in the middle. Uh, I visited a Mayan temple and um, you see how gorgeous. It was Ekbalam, the Mayan temple of the jaguar god, the jag jaguar star. And I asked this young man, I said, what are the symbols that you have drawn? You can see on his, on his stomach uh, and on his legs, he's got these symbols. Next slide. He grabbed my hand and he wound our hands together. And he said, it's Hanubku. I'm telling you, it, every part of this trip was magical. But man, did I walk through a portal when he did that. And I'm going to explain to you in the next slide what Hanubku is. But I would say to us, Melissa, this is our opportunity to witness, to claim, to be different. This is yin yang. This is the cosmic universe. This is light dark. It's future and past. It's brown and white. It's colonial and indigenous. It's all of these things. It's the bridge. It is the bridge. It's the knot in the center of the Lemiscuit. It is there. And I believe it is our call to come. It's a call. Come to me, Melissa. I am Melipona. Come to me. Next slide. This is an image of Hanum Koo. Hanum Koo has a very broad definition, but you can see the white and the black, just like yin yang, which is light and dark. It's also the center of the cosmic universe. The Mayans understood literally that center point of our galaxy. They knew where the center point, and there's nothing there, maybe a black hole. They knew where that center point was in their cosmology, their 26,000 year Mayan calendar is literally our galaxy turning on its axis around Hanum Ku. Hanum Ku is everything, nothing. Hanum Ku is God. And he grabbed my hand and in one simple gesture like that, there's the universe. Next slide. Um, there are, th this is a picture of Mayan books called the Mayan, called codices. The Spanish, when they, um, conquered um, the, the Yucatan, conquered the Mayans, the priests destroyed all of the books except three books. There are only three remaining Mayan books. One of those Mayan books, and they're named after where they ultimately landed. This one landed, went, was sent to Madrid and, and wasn't burnt. So this is the Madrid Codis. The Madrid Codis is a 112 page book. The last 12 pages of that 112 page book are about beekeeping and melipona. Next slide. So in those codices, there are symbols and the Mayan, this would be a whole nother <laughs> years of a lecture. Um, the Mayan glyphs and the Mayan calendar, there's a calendar within a calendar within a calendar. 
their basic calendar is 20 days. So that 20 day calendar that keeps repeating itself and repeating itself and they're, they're cogs of a wheel that turn to the next cog, to the next cog to get to the 26,000 year cycle. The 20 day calendar, one of the symbols in that 20 day calendar is the symbol Seeb. There are different pronunciations. Keeb, Seeb, Keeb. And it is the symbol that represents the bee, the beehive, honey, wax, candle, owl. And I think that's interesting that bee and owl are, re owl are represented by the same symbol, one solar, one lunar. But the owl is about vision and night vision and seeing in the dark and seeing what's behind the light. So I, I find that really interesting. The symbol is depicted differently if, if it's a written symbol or if it's a carved symbol. Next slide. And Keeb, uh, these are some of the attributes of Keeb. Trust your inner voice. It's the galactic conduit. It's mystic reception. It's cosmic consciousness. It's the interdimensional guide. Next slide. Okay. You'll see it written different ways. Keeb, Keeb, and the bottom one I can't even pronounce. <laughs> but the Mayans of Guatemala have a, a, a different way of speaking than the Mayans in the Yucatan. So what I want to point out here, don't know how to do it with my fingers, you see the three bars on the top and the three bars on the right and the left side. Okay, hang on for this one. Those are stargates. The symbol for B is written, because this is a pictograph language, the symbol for B is written with stargates on it. Next slide. Okay, in the Mayan Codis, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. I'm gonna wrap us back around in a minute. In the Mayan Codex, it's said of the water lily. This is a reference to the water lily. I drink the precious liquor, liquor of the aquatic flowers, the beautiful narcotic flowers that intoxicate and see that I am the unique image of the gods. I am their creation and the flowers color my heart. The water lily motif is often seen or most seen at temple centers of divination or astrological calculation. Next slide. So just similar to Egypt, in the Yucatan, uh, the highlands of Mexico, down into Guatemala, this lily grows, it's a native lily. The lily grows naturally and wild. The bees love this lily because it has so much nectar. So the bees are humming all over this lily. Well, the lily, it, I'm going to spray myself with some, <laughs> while I talk about it, with some lily uh, essence. The Egyptian blue lotus and this lily are sisters. The same effects that you get by ingesting or smoking the blue lilies, lily, the Egyptian blue lily, the Egyptian blue, blue lotus, which is actually a lily, it's a misnomer, it's not a lotus, but it's called blue lotus. 
you get the same effects, which means it's a bit narcotic. You can get dreamy. You can feel time contract and expand. The honey produced by the bees that are foraging on this lotus is a, is a narcotic honey. So the honey itself, maybe like mad honey, would be in Turkey. The honey itself has a bit of a hallucinogenic quality. Now, the Mayans take the seeds of this lotus and, or, I'm sorry, this lily, they mix the, the seeds with honey. They create a drink that's similar to a mead called balche, and it was the shaman's drink to aid the shaman in opening up their consciousness. So the shaman's drink is created by mixing lotus seed, lily seeds, with melipona honey and fermenting it. Next slide. Okay. Now, in the tradition of Graham Hancock, Andrew Goff, and Laura B., I had the idea, what if the bees themselves are ingesting that water lily honey? What if the bees themselves are having an expanded consciousness? What if the bees, as we know, are interdimensional? What if they're moving back and forth in that altered state and gathering information from the other side of the stargate and bringing it back to the shamans while they too are sitting in expanded consciousness of the honey and the water lily. The Mayans knew things that blow your mind. They knew stuff that we can't even explain today. They built pyramids that are extraordinary. The Mayans are credited with the first people coming up with the concept of zero. The Mayans knew where the center of the Milky Way galaxy was. They knew that point. They have this amazing calendar. They know when the solstices are. They know when the eclipses happen. How, where did this information come from? And I would say, possibly, the bees brought them the information. Look at those eyes. Can you not see that their vision is extraordinary. Next slide. Okay. This is when I met the Melipona. At the end of my trip, I was invited by Francisca, uh, the woman in the yellow, to come to her home. And she said, no, oh, come to my home. I went to her home and we walked through the home and out the back door. And I swear to God, I wasn't thinking Stargate, but I was thinking Portal. She had 60 Melapona hives, 60 Melapona hives in her backyard. And everywhere around me, everywhere, were buzzing bees. And then she and her husband wanted me to see the bees and they started opening hives. So it was an experience that was so extraordinary. It changed my life. Next slide.
Uh, this is a two minute video of Francisca, Francisca showing me the inside of her hive. Go ahead, Laura. Video. Sometimes, because she does a lot of volunteer work, she doesn't have time to take care of the Laura, do you want? Okay. Laura, that it, it's okay. You can um, then. Francisca offers me honey. You see her. She takes it out of the hive with a syringe, and then she pours it into my hand. So that's the last bit of the video. But you can go to the next slide. So here's the vision. The Melipona bees. help the environment, they're endangered, they're part of the indigenous Mayan tradition. I would like to help create a Mayan women's Malapona cooperative. I would love the College of the Melissa to be part of that. I would love Bee City USA to be part of that. Um, the women could stay in their villages. It would be a way for them to generate money. The, the Melipona honey sells for 10 times as much as regular honey does because it's so much easier to manage regular European Apis mellifera. The, the people have, in favor of the Melipona, they've started they've let those traditions go and they're and they're doing regular beekeeping because it's more productive and and easier so with a, a women's cooperative they could sell the melipona honey they could um they could sell the wax they could split the hives and and keep expanding the project it is part of their Mayan tradition and it would be a way to keep the traditions alive. So that is my vision to 
uh, go back and uh, lay the groundwork and see what all the pieces are that will that it'll take to bring that that vision together. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a prayer to the Melipona bees, Laura. <laughs> So that was a song sung by a Corandera to her Melipona bees. This is, I'm going to end here, a prayer uh, found in the codices to the beautiful lady, foreign divine queen lord. I wash her wings, I give strength to her wings. Thank you, everybody. Should I just jump in? Uh, thank you. Can I interrupt for a second? Yes. If, if anybody has questions, write them into the chat and we'll compile them and ask Patricia and Rebecca at the end when we have time for a Q&A. Just in case you have anything that you're thinking of, capture it in the chat. Thank you, Rebecca. That was beautiful. That was really beautiful. And I will start by um, repeating what you said, just that this is um, the beginning of a long study of um, a dream, a vision, is putting into words a vision that both Rebecca and I have had for a long time. And speaking it to you today is that intention moving forward in creating this beautiful bee sanctuary for, for the Melipona bees in Mexico. So I'm really excited to, to be a part of this and to be sharing this presentation with you, Rebecca. It's, it's, um, a long time dream come true. So um, I will um, start by just sharing a little bit about my own experience with the Meliponas. Similar to Rebecca, um, well, I was born and raised in Mexico, central Mexico, San Luis Potosí. So it's right on the um, Tropic of Cancer, which is right on the edge of where the Meliponas um, habitat extends to. So part of my state in the tropical part of it does have meliponas, but they're mostly like from there down. So they live in the tropics. I'll show you a map. Um, I, so I, I didn't grow up in the Yucatan, but you know, in Mexico. And I did travel to Mexico also around 20, 25 years ago, also in the Yucatan, did a backpacking trip and explore that whole area and was incredibly uh, just mind blown by all of it. Um, and then very similar to Rebecca, in 2012, I went back there, um, not on the winter, but on the spring solstice. And I went there with a group of women. We were doing a um, retreat 
for to meet Ishel. So it was all about Ishel, the goddess Ishel, the Mayan goddess Ishel, connecting with her and working through all of our um, chakras. So on the day of the orange chakra, we we would do a meditation every day and, and see where we would take we, we would we were taken. And on that day on the orange, I spent my whole vision in in immersed in what seemed to me like I was in this breast, in this woman's breast, this beautiful golden woman breast. And I was there and I couldn't really quite make sense of it. And I spoke to the group, like, I'm not sure what this is, but it was really beautiful. I just felt like um, such a warm embrace. Later that day, I went and met the Milponas and I realized that I was in one of the honey pots like as you saw them in the video they definitely are like a woman breast right they have like a little nipple and everything and that's where the honey comes from where they um take it out with the syringe so i i, I saw it i was like oh uh, yes this was me getting to know the, the meliponas um so i will uh now share my screen and show you my presentation one second Uh, okay, do you see it? Yeah, you see it? Let me just put this in a slide presentation. Okay. Uh, here we go. You see it? Uh, so this is me meeting the Meliponas, and I had a similar experience to Rebecca where they um, opened up a hobon for me, and I had some honey in my hand, and then the bees just came, and it was just the most beautiful experience. It was such a, like, moment, you know? It's hard to describe it, but similar to Rebecca, it's this portal, like, all of a sudden, you're just immersed in a different alternate universe reality just in that space it's it's incredible and i have right here with me some melipona honey um and i um anointed myself with it before starting this presentation so that i can be in the energy of of these bees and the, their honey that they produce uh, so here's the map, you know, about the Meliponas, where they live, and you can see that they live not just in the Americas, but in the whole um, tropical region of the world. So there are some in Africa, there are some in Asia, and there are also some in Australia. So this is the, their habitat. As compared to this map below, you can see the extent of where the um, the more known um, Apis mellifera that we know, the European honeybee, um, the extent in the world, which is most of the world, except for like the very, very cold parts. Now, you know, we're focusing on the Melipona beche, which is the, the, the specific um, Melipona from the Yucatan. However, there's a lot more types of stingless bees. So there's the melipona and then there's the trigona and there's other ones. But the trigona and the melipona are the main bees. And I just want to show you a quick picture of the trigona because she's also a really, really beautiful bee. So I also met the trigonas um, when I was in that same trip to Yucatan. And I have seen trigonas and meliponas also in the Amazon and you know in other parts in, in Asia. So they do extend it to other parts of the world. The Melipona Beche, however, which is what we're talking about specifically today, is only in the Yucatan region. So just to orient you, here is the, the Mayan region, which extends through you know, the whole area of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, but also through Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador. For today, I'm going to be focusing on talking to you of this particular area, these temples, which are the ones that are mostly um, where the, the Mayan gods and 
the what I'm going to be talking about you happens, um, which, you know, I'll talk to you a little bit about the Melipones, but Rebecca has already said a lot. I'm going to be talking to you more about the the Mayan gods related to bees and also Ishel, which is um, very related. And then I will go at the end into a little bit about um, Oshun, which is not Mayan. It's of the um, Ifa tradition, but also a representation of a bee goddess in the Americas and Africa, but I feel like it's important that we talk about her as well as we're talking about the, the, the representation of the bees in the Americas. So this is the extent of where the Meliponabeche extends within, you know, geographically. Um, just so you get the, the visual representation of that. We talked already about how this nests happen and how they're different from um, honeybees, uh, the um, European honeybees, but one of the main differences is that they build this pyramid and that's where in this pyramid is where the larva happens. The, the honey is stored in this other little um, you know, pots, little breasts. I call them breasts. I think they're like breasts. Um, that's where the honey and the pollen get stored and whoops, um, the larva only happens on the pyramid shape um, forms. And here is the, the inside of it. So you can see the difference. So this over here, the pyramid, which is sort of in the center of the formation of the hive, that's the larva. And then outside over here in the breast, is where the honey happens. And can anybody find the queen? She's right here, you can see her. She's a little bit bigger, her abdomen, you know, it's bigger. She's not a very old queen, but, or maybe I took the picture on the side so she doesn't look as big as some of the um, pictures that we saw from Rebecca, but she's definitely larger when you see her. So a mesun cob, a mesun cob is the, um, the bee god in the Mayan tradition. And these are just some of the images. There's a lot of images that were found in the codex. Um, one interesting thing is that Cobb, the name Cobb in the, in the name of the, Maya, of the honey god is, it means hive, it means honey, but it also means world. And so we can think that Cobb was very much involved in the creation of the world. Um, we don't, there isn't an exact, you know, history as to how this happened, but there's a lot of assumptions as to how this is very much related. One of those things is, was found in the Tilambalam, which is also one of the books and there's a lot of information here. I don't want to overwhelm you. As Rebecca said, each one of these things, we could spend a whole hour in, 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 in each one of these um, slides. But I'm just going to try to be brief because I only have so much time. So um, the mythology, the Mayan mythology and their cosmovision talks about having four guardian deities. Each one of these four guardian deities was assigned a color and a cardinal point within the cosmos. And they were believed to be the ones that were holding up the sky. They, they thought the earth was flat. And they, so each one of these guardians held the sky. In the Chalambalam, it talks about these guardian deities as, as the bees. And it talks about, you know, the, and you can see here the ritual of the world, four world quarters. The red wild bees are in the east, a large red blossom in their cup. The red plumeria is their flower. The white wild bees are in the north. The white pancachai is their flower. And this again is a translation of the, trans, the Spanish translation of the Mayan. So some things may be lost, but a white, a large white blossom in their cup. 
the black wild bees are in the west and the black laurel flower is their flower. A large black blossom is their cup. The yellow wild bees are in the south and a large yellow blossom is their cup, is their flower. So how the origin of the, and the relationship of the bakabs with each one of these bees as the guardians, um, it's, it, there is like all the information is not there, but I do agree with Rebecca that somehow the bees had this extended, um, a, a very important, crucial part in the creation of the earth and how they're seen as um, intricate part of the cosmovision of the Mayans. So there, there's a lot more to be said, but in the in the codexes, you know, with the ones that were remained and we were able to start, we're able to study now. There's a lot of representation of the of this god. You can see him here. Here's a mesun cob, and this would be the image of a person bee tending. And so this is the original bees, how they live the, in the hobones and, and logs. And so each one of the symbols up here, like all of the symbols represent a part of the hobon. So you can see this right here talks about how the brood looks like inside of the log. And this over here shows also how the brood looks like and how the honey pots look like. And the inside, of the hive how that is represented and then the the guardian bee is right there right so you see this here like this, there's this little image of the guardian bee which is just so cute when you meet the guardian bee it's, it's just really adorable because that guardian bee never leaves the spot it's like there the whole time a bee comes in and moves out of the way but then it's right there like it just never leaves the entry opening unguarded it's like all the time on guard um so the the pyramid you know the formation of this pyramid is really spectacular when you're able to see it and i'm going to tell you a little bit about the the ritual you know some of it we don't, we don't know all all of it some of it has been lost but we do know that one the drink that um rebecca mentioned it was created and it was used ceremonially to bring an enhanced state to access information. And this drink was created with the mixing, uh, it was created in, a, in this tree, and I have the next slide, is the balche tree. So the balche tree, tree it's, um, it's a leg, legume tree, and that the, the bark of it, it's dried up. You can see this image below here, how this happens. It's dried up and then they put the melipona honey in there and they put water and they put other seeds, which may be, you know, as Rebecca mentioned, the lily trees or different things to, depending on what they were needing. And they let this ferment. And then once the drink was, was fermented, it was drank ceremonially. Um, to en to enhance you know the spiritual connection and and enhance access to information this is the tree which also i think it's a really beautiful tree it has the purple flower which is of course we know that bees are very attracted to the purple and they're very much visited by by bees there they are <laughs> in rebecca's head um, so Koba, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Koba. Like, I like um, as I mentioned, I'm going to tell you about a, a little bit of the uh, relationship between the geography of the sites and the gods. So Koba, highlighted here in red, is one of the main temples where Amesun Kab is um, honored. And this right here, the temple of the paintings or the paintings group, I think that's the main pyramid 
to Amazon Cobb, and I will show you with the next slide. You can see, you know, this is where it is in the jungle. It's been, uh, this other one hasn't been fully um, excavated, so only part of it can be seen. But here's the pyramid, and here is the honeycomb pyramid, and here is Amazon Cobb coming out holding the pyramid, holding the honeycomb. And so you can see just this beautiful relationship. And Amazon Cobb, the image of Amazon Cobb was found at the top of this pyramid, right? It's coming out as the guardian bee of this pyramid, holding the pyramid, that image of how this all got created and how they got the, the knowledge, right, of how to create pyramids from the bees. Another um, important temple is the temple of Tulum. And Tulum also before it, by the Mayans it was used to, it was known as Sama, meaning the city of dawn. Um, the orientation of Tulum is perfectly oriented looking at Venus and the Mayan had a very strong relationship with Venus. Um, the temple of the descending god right here, it's perfectly aligned so that the light comes in on September 6th, which is the, the celebrated birthday of the descending god and is carefully aligned with Venus. Um, the descending god also is believed to also be a Mesunkab. So it's sort of like they're the same, but they're known by different names. And I'm going to show you here. So this is, this is the main temple, and this is the temple of the descending god aligned perfectly with Venus. And here's the, the sunset coming through um, that portal that gets created on the temple of the descending god and then on the backdrop you have the beautiful beautiful caribbean which is just uh, spectacular um and i'm going to just briefly go into this because it venus was such an important alignment and star that they the mayans follow and these temples are all focused with that and venus has this um the dance of venus which is an eight year cycle and in this eight-year cycle, it creates this amazing five-pointed star. We just, so there was a, the Dance of Venus that started on 2012, and we just ended that eight-year cycle last month and are about to start a new eight-year cycle. So I found this really interesting because um, you know, 2012 was known to be like the sort of the end of the Mayan world. And now we're entering into this new eight year cycle. And I put it out there for, for all of you just to think about, you know, what have you completed in this eight year cycle? And to think about what are your intentions for this new eight year cycle moving forward? I know for me in this eight year cycle, 2012 was when I met the Meliponas. It was also when I had a very deep initiation with, with Oshun, which I'll tell you about coming up soon. It was also the beginning for me of working more intently with um, plant medicines and just deepening into my spiritual practice. So when I found out about this eight year cycle, cycle and that we're just right now, last month, starting a whole new one, I thought it was important to share with you so that you keep it in your in your mind and in your awareness of as to what you want to create with this new eight-year cycle of Venus. Um, and again just to touch on on Venus and how important it is this image um, this is found in the um, in Palenque in, in Chiapas so it's not in the area that I'm talking about, but also in the Mayan region. And this is the observer of the astrological observer. And right here we have the Venus symbol. And when you see some representation of a Mesun Kab, 
his eyes are Venus. So there's a very strong relationship between Venus and Amesulkab, the descending god, and just the, the whole you know, creation of the cosmology for the, the Mayan world. So here's again the descending god. I just want to show you, I have a lot of um, slides with a lot of images just because I want you to see all of the different representations of this god. And, and you can see, you know, in a more human form how Amesulkab is represented, but also in a more animal form as a bee, you know, right here and right here as a bee emerging from the hive and always holding that, that pyramid, right, that, that hive in it. Again, more, more images of Amazon Cove. Cozumel. So Cozumel is over here. Oops, this little thing oops, got moved a little bit, but it's right here. And it's right in front of Coba and Tulum. It's not very far if you were to look at, at it, right? It's right in front of Playa del Carmen. It's not very far. But one of the interesting things about Cozumel, in, in Mayan it's known oi sib, sib meaning wax. But one of the interesting things about Cozumel is that it's completely flat. I mean, the whole Yucatan is pretty flat. But Cozumel is absolutely flat. You can see this image right here and there that there isn't any topography. And so when you are standing, even though it's not that far, but you're standing in Tulum, or any of the sites, you cannot see it because it's pretty much at the same level as the ocean. And there was a journey, there was a pilgrimage that happened, I believe it was every year, I'm not totally sure, where the Mayan would go from mainland to Cozumel. It was a pilgrimage and they would do it in boats and although it's not that far, it was difficult to do because it's so flat that you can't see it. And so it was a journey that was dangerous and it was mostly a, a spiritual journey. It was a spiritual journey to meet, um, and here's like a little you know, representation of how that happened. <laughs> and so modern day escenifications of how that happened. So the boats you see are very simple, just canoes made out of wood. And the men would go over to the island and this island was the island of Ischel, the goddess, the goddess Ischel, which also was the main center for the oracle. So the temple of Ischel is where the oracle was and men would go there seeking advice from the oracle. Sounds familiar? <laughs> so it's very similar to Delphi, right? Very, very similar. And the the main temple this is the main temple san gervasio in cozumel the main temple had this this long pilgrimage like a stone path that took you in that pilgrimage to meet the oracle the oracle right here it's perfectly aligned with the moon so this was all about the moon observation and being in that connection with the moon and the um, deity that was found in the temple is this deity right here, which is a, a representation of his shell. So people went there to meet the oracle and the goddess stone was there and then the priest or priestess would be behind that drinking the, the um, balche, being in an enhanced space and being the oracle for the person that came and, and seek the advice. Uh, so this is Ischel. And Ischel, um, she's one of the main goddesses in the Mayan tradition. This is the, you know, the temples of Ischel are both in Cozumel, but also in Isla Mujeres, which is another island uh, closer to Cancun that also is dedicated all to women. Um, Ischel is a very interesting goddess because she is represented both as a young 
a young um, woman, but also as an old woman. And it sort of has a lot, a lot of virtues to it. And I have some notes here because I want to make sure that I don't forget anything. But one of the main things about Ishelle is that she's known as the rainbow woman. She is, yeah, just this rainbow luminescent, all the colors are represented in her. She represents regeneration cycles and she is the goddess of the moon. So in this image, you can see her that she has a moon in her head as a younger version of her and the older version of her, she has a snake in her head and she has this pot holding water, right? And so she's the goddess of water, of the moon cycle, of love, of gestation, um, vegetation, so the cycles of vegetation. Uh, she is a medicine, she's a medicine woman. She's the goddess of, of medicine, of healers, of, um, of nature, of water, of creativity, and also of textiles of weaving. So women came and seek her help when they were trying to conceive, when they were working in some create creativity, some, some creative thing, something that you're trying to birth. You seek advice from Michelle when, when you need that help in, in birthing, birthing something. Um, so she was known to be the wife of the sun god, Akkin. And it's also often represented with a rabbit, also meaning, you know, fertility and abundance. The hieroglyphic in her name is known as Chakchel, meaning large rainbow. And here she is represented in the hieroglyphic um, symbol, just different representations of her um, as Chakchel, large rainbow. So in the younger version of her with the waxing moon, and then in the older version of her as the wanting moon, pouring the jug of water into the earth or weaving a loom. There's different representations of her, but you know, here she is with, with the rabbit. Um, she is celebrating during the month of Sip in the Mayan calendar as the goddess of medicine. And here she is just some more, you know, modern day representations of, of her as a medicine woman. The, um, and then here also, here she is holding this pot. And I found this woman of this image. I don't know if you guys can see it here. I have it blocked because of here. Um, this woman and this right here in this clay pot is a melipona nest. So I also found that, that that interesting that that's some you know some some melipona nests are hold in clay pots, and that that's what it shell holds in in a lot of the representations of her. So interesting to see also that connection with her. Um, some of the uh, she's represented with some of some of the gems that represent her are of course the rainbow moonstone moonstone the opal jade, amazonite, and ammonite. And I love these two images of her because she is very, just representing of her indigenous self. And for me, Ishelle, you know, she's been in my life for a long time. As I mentioned in 2012, I went and did a retreat and that's when I really got to know her. She's a goddess that I've been working with for a long time. And I can really relate to her because I find her to be more, you know, like I'm a very curvy woman. And so I can relate to her in that way. Like she's got this, this shape that's more curvy. And yeah, I just find her more, it's easier for me to represent, to, to connect with her than with some of the, you know, European Venus and Aphrodite and those goddesses. Uh, some of her symbols are also this, like I said, the serpent in her head, the healing, she's in the moon, she's seen in the moon with a rabbit, the jaguar, 
Um, her colors are the rainbow and she is the, the womb water woman. Um, so there she is again with the lily in her hand as a representation. Uh, so now I'm going to tell you about Oshun and, you know, again, there's a lot more to say, but I'm just trying to give you just a little taste of this goddesses because there's so much to say um, that I'm cutting it short, but, but there's a lot. Oshun, there's so much I could say about Oshun. I could spend um, a long time talking, but I'm going to try to keep it simple. <laughs> Oshun is also a goddess that I've been working with for a long, long time. She has been in my life for a long time. I have a very strong connection with her. I love Oshun. She, um, as I mentioned, I grew up in Mexico. Um, I went to Central Mexico Catholic school. I was very much in that, you know, baptized, first communion, confirmation, the whole thing, Catholic school all my life. However, my mother practiced Santeria, and so I have that in my life as well, that, that religion and the connection to, to the Orishas. My father was a Pentecostal Christian, so I also have that whole other side of <laughs> religion in a very intense way that, that also has this um, you know, calling on the spirit in a different way. And I was very interested in the, in the more in the native shamanism. So I've been practicing shamanism from a very young age in Mexico. So I sort of grew up with this, a, a lot of different religions in my life and just embracing them all and, and being in that fluid dance with the synchronicity of religions and the merge that, you know, Mexico is that. Um, so Oshun represents that for me, just this, this connection. And I'll tell you a little bit about where she comes from. So she comes from Nigeria, from the Ifa tradition, from the Yoruba religion. So Ifa itself is, um, it's a spiritual system. It's not necessarily, Ifa is sort of like the main thing. And it's difficult to explain because it's not a religion itself. It's a system that has different components. The three, comp the three main components of, of Ifa, which is, Ifa is a, also an oracle. It's um, a divination system that helps you to understand if you're, if you're living your life in accordance to what your mission in life is. And it's intended to, you know, check in every once in a while. Is this the right thing? Is this the right direction? Should I do something else? When you have something big in your life, you check in. Is this the right path for my life? And that's how you find through that divination if you're in correct alignment with your mission and your life purpose. Um, so this is something that I've practiced for a long time. And the, the three components of, of Ifa in the Yoruba, the Yoruba is more the religion, but the Ifa, it has Olodumare, which is the main God creator of the heavens and earth. Uh, and it's, he's a supreme being, uh, but who is not really involved with what happens with humans. He's, you know, he, she, the non-gender being is, in a different realm. And so the Orishas are sort of the um, nature spirits. They're the nature spirits in, in everyday life and elements who can help us connect with the Supreme Being. So the Orishas are, represent all of the different nature spirits, God. So water, air, earth, metals, um, there's Orishas for all different elements and also the ancestors. Um, and they're the, the intermed intermediaries for us humans. And they're the ones that help in the divinations to connect to the main God. So that the Yoruba tradition is sort of like the, the umbrella of the Orishas. 
the Orishas then traveled, and you can see in this map how they travel, pretty much follows the slave trade. So they came to the Americas with the slave trade, and they came to different parts in South America, in Central America, in the Caribbean, in parts of the United States, and then through different parts of um, Africa and some parts of um, North Africa and, and Spain, some of the islands in Spain also practice this. So it's as they traveled the Yoruba and it arrived to the different parts of the Americas, then it syncretized with what was there. So of course, the Spanish, the Catholic influence, but also very specifically on each part of the world with the indigenous um, traditions and religions that were there. So it became different things. So in, in parts of Brazil, it became Condomble, it became Umbanda, Kimbanda, and Haiti, it became um, Voodoo, in Cuba, Haiti, Puerto Rico, part of um, the United States, and in Mexico, it became Santeria, and in Jamaica, it became Obeja. Obea. I don't know how to pronounce that very well, but it became different things, but it all has the same flavor and the same origins. It just is a little bit different. So I experienced it growing up as Santeria, but you know, it's similar. I have since worked directly with Anifa in Nigeria, um, Ab Ababalao, which is sort of the the person, you know, the the, the shaman is the Babalao who does the divination. So here are the Orishas. I like imagining them all in the you know jungle, just parting around the nature and the trees. There are three main goddesses of water, Yemanya, Oshun, and Oya, and they all represent different things. So Yemanya is the, the main goddess of the oceans, of you know, all of the oceans. Oshun is the goddess of the fresh waters. So the rivers, the, the springs, the lakes, rain. Oya is the the storms, the storm waters and the murky water. So, you know, she's got that sort of dark energy, uh, not as in bad, but just in like the force of the storms in water. And I'm gonna show you just a lot of images about Oshun uh, so that you also get to understand her flavor and her expression in different ways. So her color is yellow. Her element is water, but also honey. So she is you know, very much represented by, by honey. She is a, you know, she's sort of like Venus or Aphrodite. She is uh, the goddess of love, sensuality, fertility, self-love, lavish abundance, healing, divination. Um, bees and honey are very much part of her, her symbols and her elements. And she represents the sweetness of life. She, you know, as you can just see, like, she's, she's very, very important. She's, she's water, and water is life. So that's what Oshun is. Um, some of the symbols for Oshun are, um, she always wears a crown. She's very much into just the, the beauty, like being shown in a very goddess-like manner. So also um, shells, cowrie shells. Um, her fruits are tangerines, yams, pumpkins, sweet potatoes, anything yellow, it represents her. Um, sweetness, nectar, honey, she, um, her crystals are citron and imperial topaz and amber and her metals are gold and brass. So here she is, she's often represented with a mirror, like she's looking at herself, right? She just knows she's gorgeous, she knows she's beautiful, and she's always looking at herself and her dance 
and she just can move the world, right? She's just able to bring life to the world. And she, um, yeah, what can I say about Ashun? She's represented as the, the sweetness of life. She's a very powerful, powerful goddess. In my experience with her, how I got to know her, and I will try to be brief with this, but she came to me. I was, um, I have had endometriosis for most of my life since I was 18. This is the first time I went to the emergency room with horrible agonizing pain. I um, suffer of this without really knowing and getting a diagnosis for many years. In 2011, I had um, I had surgery because I had three ovarian cysts that needed to be removed. And at that point, then I was diagnosed with endometriosis because they finally went inside and they were like, yeah, you have a very severe case of endometriosis. We'll have to, you know, we recommend that you just remove your whole reproductive system because this is so all over the place. And so, of course, I was very shocked by this news, trying to understand how to um, to deal with that, and I'm getting very thirsty. Oshun, uh, she wants me to tell you that she's water, right? So it's not just the water of the rivers, but it's the water that we drink every day, like the water in our shower, the water in our system. So drink your water and just think that this is Oshun who you're taking in. You're taking Oshun into your life, water, life. Thanks, Oshun, for the reminder. Um, so I had this very, you know, severe diagnosis, um, that I needed to figure out what to do. And so I thought that was a good time for me to do a divination and the Babalao who I was working with was in Nigeria. So every time I had to schedule this is complicated because it, depending on the reading of the, of the shelves, um, different things are required. And so in this case, I needed to send something that I had worn a night and then had to be shipped to, to New York where the person who was helping me do this and then to Nigeria, to the Babalao. And so it was taking a while. I didn't know when my ritual was going to be hap was going to happen. And so I, you know, from the time I schedule it to the time it happened, I, I never know when it, it's gonna happen. So I was walking into the apiary one day and I was about to open up the hive and then I got the call. They're like, oh, your ritual in Nigeria is about to start. Just make sure you're in a place where you can receive the energy. And so I was like, well, should I do this in the hive or just sit outside the hive or, and, and in this case, it doesn't always happen, but in this case, the Orisha that was doing the ritual for me was Oshun. And so I figured, well, I should do this in the hive. So I went into the ritual with this prayer of like, we're doing this ritual to figure out how to heal myself from this endometriosis, which is a condition in the reproductive system. Bees, I need your help. I need you to help me heal because I am in this place where I can't be going to the emergency room all the time and be a voice for you to your work and not be healed. And so as I'm opening up the hive and this ritual is happening for me in Nigeria and I'm working with Ashun and I'm praying to the bees and somehow I lift the box and the bottom box, the bottom um, base drops. And so the bees just got pretty upset and I got stung maybe 40, 50 times in the legs. I had a half suit, but I knew it was pretty bad. And he was like, okay, Thank you, Beast. I got your medicine. I closed the hive really quickly, as quickly as I could, and I left to my office so that I could, you know, be in this place that I was starting to get a very strong reaction, and I did. I had, you know, was covered in hives. I lost my vision. Everything went white. I purged for hours until there was nothing left, and I, at that moment, there was a moment there. I was like. How bad is this gonna get? How you know, should I call 911? 
and I could clearly hear this voice saying, no, we are healing you, just let it all go. And I did, continued my purge until there was nothing left. Um, and then, you know, I, I went to sleep, I slept for like 14 hours. I woke up the next day and I was just feeling like, holy, I am alive. And I am filled with the energy. I am filled, I am so grateful for this medicine. And I couldn't quite understand how it happened, but this, so this happened in 2011, so it's been nine years. And I've been pain-free since then. And I still have my ovaries. I didn't do that removal of my uh, reproductive system, but it, it created this very deep, strong relationship with both Oshun and the bees. I was able to understand their medicine in a much deeper way. I started studying apitherapy so that I could learn more about how their healing happens. And I also understood that my condition, my reproductive system, and why endometriosis happens by exposure to pesticides is the same thing that's happening to the bees. That exposure to pesticides is killing them. They're, they are the reproductive system of the world. And in the same way that they're being, oh, I, sorry, my cat just jumped in my screen. In the same way that, uh, let me see if I can find my slide again, here we are. In the same way that we are being affected by pesticide and the environmental conditions, the bees are also being affected in the same. So we're one and the same. And so it made a much deeper commitment with my work and my work to help bees because by you know helping bees we're helping ourselves we're helping our own health we're helping the health of the earth um and oshun has been with me since since then so i wanted to share also oshun to you because she's a very important goddess of the bees of bee medicine in the americas in africa and so I, I thought it was important to also speak about her. And I could talk a lot more about her, but I will um, stop right there. I just wanted to share this, this image. Um, this is a drawing that I did a couple of years ago, trying to sort of... Patricia? Patricia? Yes, I'm out of time. Two minutes. That'll Thank give you. us 15 minutes of uh, talking. Okay. Perfect, I'm about done. So this is, you know, how I see it, Oshun and Ishel. So Oshun is the water, Ishel is the rainbow. They work together, right? In, in, my, in my way of working with the goddesses, they're both very much a part of me. This is how they work together. And this is Bobinsana, which is also rainbow medicine from the Amazon rivers, from the waters. And I want to invite all of you, this is just my, my understanding of these two goddesses, but I want to invite all of you to, to talk to them. They're there, they're available to you, and for you to develop a relationship with them because they are very much, you know, available to anyone. And, and they're incredible, they're powerful, they are um, they're there for you, and, and I... Yeah, just want to invite all of you to to develop your own relationship and, and understand how they work for you. This is just me telling you my my experience. So, with honey in my heart, thank you very much. I am so excited to bring um, Meliponas and the America Goddesses to this conversation. So, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. If you can stop share, then we can go into gallery. Yep. Uh, stop share. Yep. All right. Wow, that was amazing, you guys. I am so impressed. I am so impressed with the depth and um, of many of the qualities of depth of within that presentation. It was just absolutely you really showed the rahiba qualities of taking a subject and bringing 
all of the elements from the science all the way into the mystery. You guys just really nailed that. Really, really beautiful work. I switched and now you see my kitchen. So boom. <laughs> Zoom room. Here I am in the office. Okay. I had some, I had, I mean, you guys, this is an entire course. This is an entire several month installment course. It's very, very deep, very amazing. And to me, there were so many connections with the Melipona that I'm in awe of the remarkable similarities in some of the symbol systems of the Melipona. And reminder of the African influence, both in the later times of history due to slavery, but also in our origins you know, in the cultural origins, like the Melipona story came from Africa, but didn't all people come from Africa? I think that's something we've been told. So is that story truly a split myth, a twin myth of this ancient African story that Melipona, as we know, given to us in so many ways by the Egyptians, has a lot of the same, you know, um, uh, symbol systems. So I really wanted to just really just give you guys rapid fire and see if this spurs anything. First of all, Patricia, that plant you showed at the end, I had a dream about Melipona bees and that plant in my first or second year of the College of Melissa before I knew anything about it. And I thought it was a weird dream. I thought it was like some kind of like weird dream. Like, why am I dreaming about these weird, like, you know, but you showing that plant reminded me entirely of that dream. And I have to talk to you about that. Um, clearly that's another symbol within this whole thing of both of you visioning and all of us probably having our own experiences of things that they write. And can I get a hello holler? Like how many of you related to pieces of that, like on a deep, deep level. Right. Um, but the um, the Egyptians say that the bees taught them how to make pyramids. The Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs used beehive tools to indicate their royal uh, lineage, just like uh, you show that you shall have the beehive pot. That would make perfect sense. The goddess Neith holds the beehive tool. Ishel holds the beehive pot. Um, Venus, holy cow, that is the bee goddess. Uh, uh, planet, every single one of them, every single one of them is about Venus, all of them, including, guess what, our symbol for the College of the Melissa. That symbol is part of a series of crop circles that appeared that has been studied to indicate the return of Venus on the planet. Guess when we started? 2012. Guess what? That means we just finished one whole cycle of the College of the Melissa. And that just like, I mean, whoa, return of Venus, blah, 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 blah. I mean, what? That was freaking me out. The columns on the temple that you showed, Patricia, the three pillars, the gate, the gate, all of the bee cultures say that they came from the stars. That's just the thing. That's what they all say, every single one of them. They came from the stars. Um, and who else wears pillars on as a symbol? Artemis, okay? Let's get jiggity with that because Ishel, lotus and rabbit. Artemis, lotus and rabbit. I'll give you the little India thing there. Um, vegetation, moon, love, mothering. Medicine, snake. The path of pollen, the ancient priestess tradition that some of you have attended, the weaver, the spinner, this, there's a textile art piece that came from the ancient mysteries within that priestess tradition. Hello, textile art shell. The water lily blue lotus dreamers. Yes, Rebecca, that whole thing that you and I were just vibing on hardcore when we were in and with Carlisle, remember? We were just getting all into the blue lotus, not even knowing what we're talking about, but we're just like wanting to bathe in the stuff. It was like the whole story of our connection was all about the blue lotus. I mean, that was part of our thing. Um, um, and the eye mystery, obviously. Malapona, African myth, 
the eye, the God getting the eye, all these eye stories, right? All throughout these different um, parts of our um, lesson on sacred bee, bee goddesses. The other thing, uh, the Ishel is the wife of the sun god. Artemis is the twin of the sun god, right? So we are talking about when, when and uh, Jung would say that we are pointing all of these synchronicities, which aren't synchronicities at all. These are actually ancient, ancient archetypal um, mythologies that remember when we study Shakambari about all of the goddesses' names being called together, all of the goddesses at the end times when all is destroyed, all of those goddesses' names being called into the one goddess. Maybe it's because they were the one goddess to begin with and it was just these fractured pieces and we just are remembering that all of us have that same uh, goddess, you know, that we all have her, whether it's Mother Mary with the goddess of ocean with her ocean blue robes, whether it's Oshun with her golden honeycomb, whether it's Artemis, goddess of the moon, who's a plain-faced woman, which is why I appreciate her and relate to her. And she is uh, the goddess of the moon and all of these things of fertility, virginity. But one last thing, I was surprised you didn't mention Kolel Cobb. Do you know who that is? You know who that is, Patricia. Um, who? Sorry. Kolel <laughs> Cobb. Is the other bee goddess, the bee god? Yeah. Wife, right? So, yeah, I had it in one of my slides, but I think I went too fast through it. But right. there's you... two. Yeah, there's two. And I couldn't quite understand. It was like Noyun Kam and Amus and Kab. And it seems like they're both superior beings, two large bees who, like, govern the bees. Dude, dude it's the same thing. They are yeah. the same one. It's the wife of them. Kolel Kab means lady. That prayer that Rebecca uh, read, is it to Mazen Kab or is it to Kolel Kab? You know, like, is it, is it, I mean, just because patriarchy showed us this is the story and this is what the Mayans remembered, right? That's how it's been told that Kolel Kab is the, I mean, Mazen Kab is the dude, but how do we know? that some parts of these stories aren't actually conflated and they're really, they're really um, stripped versions of the goddess story that are, that are married into the God story. Yeah, Rebecca, you, you had something. Um, it, it's my understanding of that prayer is that the shamans or coranderas, corandera is a word that means shaman, the female shaman, that they are literally honoring the bee or the spirit of the bee, that that prayer isn't ad addressed to al and Kab, but addressed to the bee as the divinity, as your sister. The Mayans referred to bees not as bees, but as people. So their word, it means people. And they have words for God that, are a combination of man, woman, be. Mm -hmm. All that strung together means God. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, in their culture, as Patricia was talking about Orishas, the Mayans also, everything are their relatives. Everything is alive. Everything has spirit. So I don't think it was a prayer to God, male God, Elmuz and Cobb. I think it was literally a prayer. My sister be, my mother be, my, my God be. I bless your wings. I wash your wings. I bless you. Right. I thank you for being in my world. This is my point. That is exactly, you made my point that truly that really that the 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 mystery within that it's not to the god be uh the shakambari isn't calling on a particular god it is calling on all the names to unite you know the mother goddess all of these goddess archetypes are so um ancient 
And a lot of these patriarchal names, and I'm just asking a question, you know, none of it, maybe that's something to explore in the next, you know, few years is what is, where did that come from, um, that name? And what is, it sounds like Patricia might not know more, but some of my questions for future reference, because we only have a couple minutes, um, is that her, like Artemis is really an older goddess, like Neith is really an older goddess, is Kolel Cobb an older goddess? Because her name Kolel means moon or something like that, and earth, just like Artemis is related to earth goddesses and moon goddesses as well, as well as Neith, you know? So anyway, that was just something I'm really interested in looking at in the future. Um, there were a lot of questions that came in and I'm really, I'm hoping that everybody gets a chance. Maybe um, Rebecca and Patricia, you can look at the questions and answer them um, in an email. Did, I, I did see that Steve had asked about the Mayan language and the Mayan language is a living language, still vibrant, uh, still spoken. There are, the women quite often will stay behind in the villages and the men go out and leave the village and go find employment in the city, but the women may not even know how to speak Spanish. So the Mayan language is, is and a living a people. And a living people. The way that we speak about indigenous people now is not only did they do these things, but they still do or they still are. I mean that's just a little little language shift. But yeah, you just you just said that really wonderfully. I wanted to mention two things before we close class today. Um, um, one was that I thought it would be cool. I heard the beautiful, um, in that beautiful video you showed, Rebecca, the word, he talked about the Africanized bee robbing, right? And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we got out our term that we're developing in the College of the Melissa? And I thought, well, this is awesome because Melissa and Phyllis are here and they both know a lot of people and maybe they'll like this term that we're trying to get out for the Africanized bee. Um, so the Africanized bee is, um, we feel, not an appropriate term. It has been discovered in genetics. Melissa, you might have even told me this. I can't remember who told me this, but the genetics for aggression are actually from the mellifera. So not only is it inappropriate, to say Africanized for the aggressive behaviors. It may even be connected to our um, racist you know, history. And it certainly is implied in the modern context um, if we're thinking about calling it Africanized because of the aggressive tendencies. So we decided in the College of Melissa to try to get the word equatorial hybrid. And if people say, well, what do you mean equatorial hybrid? We say, you know, Apis mellifera scutellata. And our response is, uh, because it's not really appropriate to call them Africanized because uh, they're an equatorial hybrid bee. So that's, um, hopefully you'll like that term. And then the other thing, I really loved what you said, Patricia, new word for the dictionary, guardian bee. Isn't that lovely compared to guard bee? Guard bee with the gun and the hat and don't make them laugh and guardian. Like what shall enter? What passes? You know, it's not a defense. It's a it's a holding space. Yeah, Rebecca. Just really, I know we're out of time, but quickly, another word for the guardian bee is uh, balam cob. So jaguar bee is the name for guard guardian bee. And jaguar is the, the, in the pantheon, the, the highest of gods. So there's so many, it, we could just, we're gonna go on forever. We can overlap and overlap and overlap of all the connections. It's, it's extraordinary. And Steve, I, I wanna say also, um, Steve seeded the thought or the idea um, that we can compile for the Melipona information that isn't captured anywhere, or it, or we don't know, just like, not just like, but in a similar way that Simon Buxton brought to the world information. Oh, Rebecca, we lost you for a second. I'd like to- We can be the keepers. 
of yep. the information of Mel. Well, what I'd like to say is let's offer ourselves in service to the people who are the keepers of the Melipona. And, um, right. you know, let us offer ourselves in service. Let us bring gifts from the mellifera, the colonial creature, to the Melipona and to the people of the Melipona. Let's protect the Melipona from the encroachment of the mistakes of, of the crossbreeding and the uh, mistakes of colonial beekeeping. Um, you know, uh, let's, let's offer ourselves in those ways to this project. And I am so 100% behind you. I love it. I'd love us for to be involved in that way. I'd like to say, uh, we'll keep it open for 15 minutes after saying thank you, just to give everybody a chance who has to go to honor people's time. That really thank you, Rebecca and Patricia. This is igniting a fire of passion. Um, I am absolutely thrilled. I'm so grateful that you both had this vision and another Jungian thing to point towards truth. You, and to have this reminder of my dream as well. And I can't wait to see what this has jogged for the rest of you. So um, if you found something inspirational or exciting, or you want to say thank you to um, Patricia and Rebecca, please just, you know, send something out because I know this was absolutely wonderful. A plus. B, you got a solid B. That's the <laughs> best level you can get. A solid thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you for coming in the afternoon.